Welcome to the Siegel Center, or welcome back for those who have been with us for this really wonderful afternoon. Uh, the, uh, uh, these are three very disturbing and very powerful plays. Uh, I think you will find the third one, uh, although just as disturbing, more amusing, more entertaining than the other two, which may give you a little relief although that in a way makes it more disturbing than ever, ever. Uh, 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 Abdus Sabur is a, perhaps a name that is not known to a lot of you, though he is one of the best known uh, modern Egyptian playwrights and very widely produced, not only in, in Egypt, but throughout the Arab world. Uh, he was one of the leading figures uh, in what is now generally considered the, the golden age of the modern Egyptian theater, which was the, the 19, uh, well, late, late 1950s into the early 1970s, uh, when uh, Lennon L. Romley and Alfred Farag and, and Abdul Sabur and others were creating what is now sort of the, the central repertory of the, uh, the modern Egyptian theater. Uh, this particular play is really one of the classics of the modern uh, Egyptian theater, uh, not only because it was a, 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 a major success in its own time and has been since, but because it was the, the outstanding example then and perhaps since of the effect of uh, the theater of the absurd on the Egyptian theater. This is what one might say, this is the Egyptian waiting for Godot. Uh, it's the play that people in Egypt and in the Arab world think of as that is our great absurdist play. This is not all that surprising. I mean, uh, Sabur wrote a lot of, uh, Abdul Sabur wrote a lot of different kinds of plays. Uh, mo many of the most famous ones, comedies, but he was a very, very, very prolific and, and, and versatile playwright. Uh, and when you think about it, uh, what, what could be better actually as a as a an approach than a theater of the absurd to uh, the particular theme of tonight's plays. I mean, when we, in in a way, although Dutchman has some features of absurdist theater, both the first two plays calculatedly um, use that as a way of depicting. The, the 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 bizarre and tortured quality of torturers, uh, and 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 the uh, uh, the assault of their activities and their work, both on humanity and on human reason, uh, and so this is a a, a a a very nice fit of generic expectations and and themes, um, uh, as Salma has already, as Salma has already said. Uh, it also fits into the other plays very nicely because it, it, is a, uh, it is a travel play and it is a play of power and oppression and of, of that kind of psychological manipulation. So I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Night Traveler by Salah Abdul Sabur, translated by M. M. Inani. Scene, train carriage in movement. The noise of engines provides the only background music. Time, just after midnight. Characters, a narrator, a passenger, and a conductor. On one side of the stage, that is, in the corner of the carriage, the narrator stands. She is primly dressed, a very elegant modern suit, a pinhole of fashionable tie, a striped waistcoat, or a gold watch with a gold strap. 
She could be wearing all of these. Her face is suffused with tepid serenity. Her voice, metallic, but lined with shrewd indifference. On a seat, somewhere in the carriage, the passenger sits. He is a type, a non-dimensional man, that is a man who can be described only from the outside, as fat or thin, tall or squat, dark or fair, though it all amounts, in fact, to the same thing. The conductor, who will soon appear, has a round face and a round body. He looks suspiciously innocent. <laughs> the hero, the clown of our play, is a man called, well, he's called what he's called. What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell sweet. And a hedgehog by any other name would roll itself up all the same. His line of business, any line of business, we can judge from his appearance and his attire that it's of no consequence. Let's keep it at that then. Any line of business, he's going somewhere by train at night. He managed to catch the last train, that is. And now he is counting the telegraph poles. One, two, three, five, a hundred. Fidgets and boredom. The game has no appeal. He tries to toy with his memories. He digs up the rusty ruins and tries to polish them, but how unfortunately his memories do not shine. And he knows it. His life has been colorless, and his eyes drop his days, and they vanish in ever-widening circles on the metallic floor. They don't break up, however, or splinter, for nothing solid falls down. Tick-tock. Tick-tock, tick-tock. He remembers his rosary, and he takes it out from his right-hand pocket of his trousers. But the beads fall down, and then the fingers reach out for them, and they escape and settle in between the gaps between the two seats. He tries hard to recover them, but the string snaps, and they sink further and further, deeper still, until, chased by his fumbling fingers, they scatter all over the floor, falling down. Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. And a parchment he now takes out from his coat, wherein history has been recorded in a mere ten lines. And a few names arrest his attention. The black embossed letters shine on the wrinkled leather. Alexander, tick tock. Hannibal, tick tock. Tamerlane. Monson, tick-tock, tick-tock. Alexander, Alexander, Alexander. Excuse me, a man is one with his name. A great man can come if you summon them back from the memory of history to impose their greatness and dominate the humble. And the humble can come back if you summon them from your memory to be trampled underfoot by the great. It is therefore better to forget the past so that it won't deceive us and repeat itself. Alexander, tick tock, tick tock. Alexander, tick tock, tick tock. He raises his voice as though relishing the tune. Meanwhile, a spotlight on the other corner of the carriage, opposite the narrator, reveals the conductor. He's wearing his traditional khaki uniform. Alexander. Who's shouting out my name? <laughs> Who's calling me? Who has disturbed my sleep in the corner of the carriage? <laughs> <clears throat> you? I beg your pardon. Um, who are you? Alexander the Great. <laughs> As a boy, I broke in wild cults. In my prime, I broke Aristotle in. When I came of age, I broke the world in. The passenger is astonished. His open mouth and raised eyebrows like the painted face of a poster. <laughs> He's even afraid, only to be fair just a little. He says to himself, That swarthy barrel in the khaki sack? Alexander? Uh -huh. Oh, no. The heart of 
the passenger is divided as the scales of a balance, and he moves merely to help his suspicion outweigh his fear. Welcome, Alexander. Been drinking, haven't you? <laughs> Had one too many, I bet? Ignorant. <laughs> Don't you know my real worth? I'll break you in, I swear, as I broke in the wild colts. Alexander's hand goes to his right pocket, and he takes out a folded whip, and then Alexander's hand goes to his left pocket, and he takes out a dagger. Alexander's hand goes to his belt, and he takes out a revolver. Alexander's hand goes to his throat, and he takes a poison tube. Alexander's hand goes into his back pocket, and he takes out a rope. This, however, he feels with embarrassment, and he says, Forgive me. This has killed my dearest friend. I gave the rope to my friend just to play with it, you know, but he misused it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, the tribute I paid him on his death has passed for a literary masterpiece. I didn't write the tribute myself, mind you, but I watched my minister do it. I ordered bread and wine for him until he finished it, and until he taught me to deliver it tragically and grammatically, grammar's not my strong point, you see. My minister was ambitious, however, and asked for a province in return for my going down in history as a writer. Well, I gave him the whole earth wherein he lies. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. The conductor hides the rope inside his cap. Seed may be summed up as follows. The passenger is feverish with fear, and his expression on his face changes like traffic lights. Alexander has mobilized his army. Right hand flank, the whip and the poison tube. Left hand flank, the revolver and the dagger. We daren't, of course, mention what's in his cap because it could upset him. <laughs> Nobody dares disobey my orders. Do you? No, my lord. Give me your own orders and I'll be quicker than your echo. Who knows, the passenger thought. The man may indeed be Alexander the Great. Great men, though dead, may still be alive. These are funny days, anyway. And it is wiser to be cautious. Perhaps, Perhaps if, if I, I give, give away, away he'll, he'll leave me alone, alone, the passenger said to himself. Let, Let me, me humble myself, myself to him. What do you want from me, my lord? I beg your pardon. People like you can't want anything from people like me. What I mean is, which way is your kindness inclined? How would you honor me? Would you make me a saddle for your horse? I'm bored with riding. How about an insult for your shoe? I rarely walk now. I suffer from lumbago. <laughs> Sometimes I bask in the sun and have a steam bath in the morning. Um, let me heat the water for your bath. Let me take care of your rosy towels. Let me carry your golden slippers around for you, but don't kill me, please. The conductor irritably drops his weapons, lazily stretches his empty hands out to the passenger. Kill me with bare hands, oh no. Please, try me at anything. Give me the meanest job. Trust me with the biggest. Do what you like with me, but please, don't kill me! What's the matter with you? <laughs> what are you screaming about, Mr. What, having a bad dream? Are you? Why do you cower like a frightened mouse? Haven't you been on a train before? <laughs> this! Oh, why do you grow so white when I put out my hand to you? Don't you know who I am? Can't you think who I am? You're Alexander the Great. My name is not Alexander. My name is Zahawen. The name literally means vainglorious. Hmm. What are your orders, my, my lord? The Zahawen. You're cowardly and stupid. Can't you tell from my uniform what I ask? Your ticket! Please! <laughs> this is my job. Hard work. Drags me out of bed in the middle of the night, deprives me of sleep, the most delicious bread on God's table. Sometimes there would only be a handful of passengers scattered about the carriage like cotton sacks in a deserted warehouse. Sometimes only a man or two, and the carriage would be dark cold and breathless and like the inside of a dead whale, I would know this when <laughs> standing on the platform, I hear the running of the train pulling in, the lights off and the frosty window panes revealing no human head. I get on all the same and I search all the carriages. It's, it's my duty. 
You see? I mean, I feed all the seats and, and stare into the dark. I mean, sometimes I turn the seats upside down. Sometimes I kneel down to see what's under it. Sometimes I plunge my knife into the inside of it. Indeed, I can't allow anyone to be on without a ticket. Have you calmed down yet? Your ticket, please. Passenger forgets where he has put his ticket. He searches his pockets one after another, but finally finds it in his hand. Thank you. It's a green ticket, an almost square mm. and soft. Yeah, this, is, this means you're a good man. Do you know, after my evening prayer, I had a nap. I was properly dressed, uh, ready to go to bed. I mean, when a bell rang in my head, I jumped out of bed, having had nothing to eat. Green. Thank you. You embarrassed me by putting me before yourself. Good manners win me over. Thank you. Tension, please! The most fantastic thing will happen. The conductor will open his mouth, wipes the ticket clean, tastes it with the tip of his tongue, finds it delicious, takes bite after bite, chews and swallows, and belches! Uh. <laughs> he feels his stomach and gratified. Both hands feel his tongue. He says a little prayer and kisses the palm of his hand as a sign of gratitude. And in shocked surprise, the passenger is unable to think. He doesn't know what to think. He doesn't know what to think. Your ticket! I please! I give it to you! And where my ass is it now? In your tummy? <laughs> Ceremony is lifted only between friends. Now, know your limits. You're being sarcastic, I'm sure, but sarcasm will do you no good. Your sense of humor may amuse me, indeed, but within limits. Duty will always be duty. But I did give it to you, I swear! And I threw it out the window? No, indeed, you are... What? I what? Well, I, I'm too old to lose my temper. Old enough to let my reason rule my emotion, but I can never allow my reason to break the law. So now, Mr... Will you listen, Mr... Abdul? Literally, listen. servant of God. Listen, Abdul. Let's discuss this thorny subject. As friends. Yeah, as fellow travelers, and not as opponents. Well, then... Move over. <laughs> and I'll sit by you. But you know what? Let me take my coat off first. So that you won't be afraid of me. <sighs> Some people I know are allergic to yellow. Take my advice as a friend. Don't talk of anything against your will. Hmm? Weigh your words certainly as in a balance. Think a dozen times of each question and a hundred times of each answer. Beware of tangles of speech. Words unclear can turn into ropes around your neck, but well, let's tarry until I did this go off. The conductor takes off his coat, and then there's another one underneath it. The conductor takes off his second coat, and another one still appears. We still see yellow, which reminds me, I have to comment on this color. Views of this color are very divided. Some believe that it is the color of glittering gold, and others believe it is the color of sickness, of a swallow complexion, the color of death. That's great. <laughs> now, having removed this uniform, we can talk as friends. Hmm? Now, what did you say your name was? Abdul. <gasps> My name is Sultan. Uh, uh, but it, it was Zahwen a minute ago. <laughs> Me? Zahawen? <laughs> Goodness enough, that's my superior's name. His rank, his four coats. I often dreamed I'd killed him and taken his place. His wife. Now she has a white complexion and plump thighs. Mine, old, bony. He lives in the same sunny part, west of the rosy district. You know, my home is all right. Though I'm sometimes disturbed by the shouting pedestrians and howling cars. What's your order of business? I'm a craftsman. Craftsman? My parents never bothered? 
I could never be apprenticed as a craftsman. All I can do is search the cars. Haven't missed much anyway. The pay is good, and the grading goes up to the 10 coat rank. <laughs> what was it you said your name was? Abdul. <laughs> your name is not Abdul. You're lying. But I'm Abdul. I swear. My father's Abdullah, my eldest is, is Abed, my youngest son, Abed, and my family name Abdul. Well, have you an identity card? Yes, sir. I always keep it in my right hand pocket. It's easier to reach for here, being demanded and seen a dozen times a day. One day it was demanded 86 times, and 70 the other day. No more than 90 by law. One has to be crystal clear to reveal oneself unequivocally. For every question, we must be ready with an answer. Hmm? That doesn't lead to another question. The sound fruit in the basket are not disturbed by the hands which remove the bad ones. You're apparently a good man. Keep this card always nearest to your right hand. It is your identity card, your most precious possession. Show it to me for a second, please. Thank you. Green. Nearly square, but dry. Quite all right, though. Do you know after my evening prayer, I had a nap. I was properly dressed, ready to go to bed. I mean, when a bell rang in my head, I jumped out of bed having had nothing to eat. Green. Thank you. Quite all right. Conductor raises the car to his lips. seaweeds, and sometimes how cruel of eating the flesh of the living or the dead. But we have never heard of eating paper! <laughs> this is not actually true. I'm sorry for the interruption, but I have to make another comment. The most delicious food for a man yet is paper. <laughs> and the most appetizing part of it is history. Hmm? <laughs> we devour it all the time and everywhere, only to rewrite it on different paper, still to devour it later on. <laughs> I'm surprised at you. <laughs> Thought you had a better understanding. But you know, I shan't be hard on you. Shan't censor you too much for the friendship you so cheaply threw away before it hadn't even taken shape. I am forced! Dear sir, to be formal with you. However, as a responsible official of the three coat rank, I have to abide by the words of our superior of the ten coat rank. I remember his words to us when he handed each his appointment papers. Oh, I know these words by heart, among other such pearls of wisdom, such as um, Keep your dog hungry, he'll follow thee, Master Naman Ibn al Mundir. When I hear the word culture, I feel through my pistol, Master Herman Ibn Gori. <laughs> Teach them democracy, even if you had to kill them all. <laughs> Master, Lyndon Ibn, Master Lyndon Ibn Johnson. <laughs> I can see heads that are ripe and ready for picking. al Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf. And the words of the ten-coat man himself, however, were leniently investigate, severely castigate. <laughs> Your ten coat highness, the soul of leniency, the milk of human kindness. To this man, ill disguised by a transparent mask of stupidity, let me say, I had no intention of eating your car. When I raised it to my face, I was just staring at it. And still staring at it. <laughs> still staring at it. <laughs> Hell and damnation, what is this? There's a mystery somewhere. There's a mystery somewhere. The conductor has thrown away the card on the floor, panicking, or, or, or apparently in a panic. This is a blank piece of paper. Only one individual can have blank 
papers. An individual who has existed from time immemorial, has existed as yet, or never indeed existed, though we hear of him everywhere. Some people saw him, or thought they sometimes saw him. Some have spoken to him the way I speak to you now. Some claim to have one day spoken to him. The passenger picks the paper from the floor. But my papers are not blank. This is my name. This is what I look like. <laughs> oh no. The, your papers are blank. Look, perfectly blank. Look, can't you recognize your own papers? Oh, I can see now. They are not your papers. You've stolen them. Just a minute, this is serious. Oh, the conductor takes out from one of his pockets the back of an American sheriff and he pins it to his chest. He turns his seat round to face the passenger and then he pulls the shelf out from under the seat, makes it into a table, and then he puts some papers on it. And he takes out a few pens from the back pocket of his trousers. He lights a cigarette and he twirls his mustache, wetting it and losing just a little bit of ointment from the bottle, which he takes out of the back pocket of his trousers. And then he clears his throat. <laughs> <laughs> Up you! Stand up and listen to the charge. You have killed God and stolen his identity. <laughs> and I, Ibn Ibn Zahawin Ibn Sultan, chief law enforcing officer in this part of the world, in your name, O Ted Man, <laughs> I declare the court in session. No, I haven't. That. I plead not guilty. I appeal to the Ted Coat man himself. I want his justice. Just a minute for justice to be done. Certain formalities have to be observed. That is right. Justice without informalities is like a woman unpainted. It's like a stage, even like this one of ours, without curtains. <laughs> this is why the conductor jumps up on this jumps up to sit on the luggage net, and he hangs down his legs, and he swings his boots over the passenger's head. Don't be surprised. This, too, is right. And it is said that it is the law that is above the heads of the individuals. Innocent! I swear, innocent! Innocent! Never killed anybody or stolen anything! Help me, Ted Coat Man! Are you calling the Ted Coat Man himself? I'm innocent! Innocent! I am the Ten Coat Man. Look. The conductor unbuttons his coat once, twice, seven times over, and the buttons shine through right up to his skin. Justice. Ten Coat Man. So, you want my justice? What do you know of my justice? Your justice is unequaled on this earth. Not bad. <laughs> Speak of my kindness to the weak. Uh. <laughs> You're as kind as a mother and a father. Such indeed is real kindness. That's even better. Speak of my knowledge. He knows the secrets of language and religions. His meditations put all to shame, both men and books. Good, good. What about my generosity? If he had nothing left to give away but his life, he would gladly do it. So fear the Lord when ye approach him. No, no, that's, this is reckless. I can't give away my life, not to anyone. Not because I'm a miser holding back, but I just wouldn't want to upset the cosmic order. Keeping it, my friend, is quite a responsibility. Is this your verse? No, 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 my, by, my, by, by the majesty of your glory. There are lines of dull and insipid doggery which survive in my memory from boyhood. Hmm. You know the author? al uh, Mutanabi, if, if I remember rightly. Certainly not. My intuition never fails me. This sounds like al Ain. Shabay al Ain. The passenger proves tactful. He picks one of the conductor's pens, pretends to be fascinated by this information, and asks in falling, fawning tones, Who, my lord? Shabang al Ain. A journalist in my entourage. He's fit for nothing except this hollow prattle, but it amuses me. Do you know, I'm not happy. Some fools imagine I am lucky when they go back in the evening to their shacks and sheds. They often wonder, what is it that the Ted Coat man does? He receives the highest salary, lives in a palace, controls the destinies of people, etc. They don't know, I just bear the heaviest burden that I jump out of my bed in the middle of the night if something happens. 
I leave my palace to find out for myself how things are. I retain in my mind the names of killers and murderers and those who have wicked ideas which are more dangerous than the most dangerous killers and murderers. I receive the strangers who visit our country. I suffer their dumb, malicious looks. You know, I have coffee with every caller, even with my enemies. I have 200 cups a day. <laughs> my digestion, room. <laughs> I live on a diet of boiled vegetables. Do you know that sometimes I have to go without sleep, except for a few hours a week? Oh, I don't want you to think I'm afraid of being killed in my bed. I, I'm not afraid of death, but one must be careful. And that is why I kill my enemies or buy them off alternatively. Indeed, I'm not afraid of my enemies. I'm afraid of my friends, rather. Their hearts are gnawed by envy. They smile in my face, but black spite will remain in their hearts. I am lonely. It's a lonely life, I'm lonely. Don't be sorry for yourself, my boy. Oh, I'm not sorry for myself. I'm sorry for the envious who have lost their souls. I deplore their black hearts and wish they could see the light, know the light, if only they knew what it means for a heart to be pure, to be purified by love. Cheer up, my lord. Your tears are too precious to be shed for bad people. That's right. You're apparently a good man. Just a minute. The conductor gets down from the shelf and he sits beside the passenger. The passenger believes this might be a hopeful sign, believing that his humility is about to save his neck. Let's talk as friends. Perhaps you'll forgive my looking so closely into your case, my telling you of a rumor, the veracity of which I, I cannot determine. Ascertain its veracity, my lord. You're so shrewd, so very clever. That is precisely what I'm doing. Now look, try to appreciate my position. I am responsible for the whole entire valley, and the rumor says that one valley dweller has killed God and stolen his identity card. That is the most awful thing anybody's ever heard. The rumor is false, no doubt, my lord. Well, it isn't. Unfortunately, it is quite true, though indirectly so. But how? I mean, if you'll pardon my poor understanding, what do you need, my lord? I appreciate your interest in the case. Let me clarify the matter to you. Thanks, my lord. Don't mention it. Well, <laughs> do you know what it means to lose your identity card? It means that you don't exist. Whatever steals it, whoever steals it, kills you by depriving you of your specific individuality. Forgive my ignorance, my lord. What do you mean by that expression? Your very existence. It means depriving you of your existence. You understand? Now, when I say you have killed God, I do not mean, of course, that, may God forgive me, you have. Certainly not. What I mean, rather, is that you have stolen his identity card, which amounts to the same thing. But I never did anything of the sort. Well, that's another story. We'll discuss it later on. The point now is, however, that God has forsaken this part of the universe. He never looks this way now as he is wont to do. He never gives us anything now. We've wondered what has happened. Uh, to, we have wondered what has happened, and, and the answer is someone has killed God in these parts. This is why he has abandoned us. What I mean, of course, is that someone has stolen his identity card. His identity. They've assumed his identity. And we decided first to investigate the matter in secret. We did. We examined every file, tapped all telephone conversations, photocopied all letters, held thousands, tortured 20 till they were dead, tortured 30 till named, tortured 80 till fainted. No avail. Were there any confessions? A few. A hundred, as far as I remember, but no avail. But how? 
I mean, why not? Well, God still abandons us. It is serious indeed. So much so, in fact, that I, the Ten Coat Man, no less, <laughs> have disguised myself in workers' overalls or in peasant rags. I walked down valleys or sank in the depth of the alleys. I reached the top floors by back stairs, eavesdropped on people behind walls. I painted my face white and played at firewalking at hashish takers' dens in the hope of overhearing a telltale word or getting a clue which might unravel the mystery. I hope the door might open, even a secret passage leading to the unknown. Look, here we are. Such a pair. A common plan of the valley and the ten coat man himself sitting side by side, shoulder to shoulder, talking like old friends. Who knows? And perhaps you'll reveal the secret to me. Do you realize how serious it is? How it calls for self-abnegation? Very much, my lord. Are you willing to do something for me, then? For the whole of the valley, rather? Indeed, anything for you, my lord. Let me join in the search. Join me in the search? If you will allow me, my lord. But we found him already. Who? Here he is. Who, my lord? You. But please, wait, wait. I'd like to get you in my meaning and fool. The whole question has been a carefully guarded secret, strictly confined to a number of my closest associates, but it soon broke loose, and the grievous thing was reported to my enemies. My enemies spread it far and wide, and everybody came to know about it. That is why we hardly have time to distinguish those who tell the truth from the liars. We have to be decisive. Otherwise, the order of the valley will be upset. I know what I'm doing. I'll tell everybody in tomorrow's papers that I myself have caught the culprit and killed him. Your photograph will be published everywhere, and your body will lie in its state. You're a good man, and you're of the noblest quality, worthy of the greatest sacrifice. You're willing to do something for me. Remember, let me forget about it. Forget about it now. We'll discuss it later on. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> your answer will show your taste. Let us suppose that you have a choice between four methods, or instruments of death. The whip? No. Oh, you have no taste for it? You're quite right. It's barbaric, even backward. Uh, tamarind, the barbarian. What do you think of poison? No. Doesn't agree with you either. You're right. It is a method tinged with meanness and treachery. It's the Medici method. What about the revolver? <laughs> no. No, no, no. I don't like it myself. It's killing from a distance. It lacks the warmth or uh, touch. It's a vulgar modern method game for the young and cowardly. What we need is a classical method. If death is to retain its splendor, its grandeur, the dagger. Alexander, I am sorry, Abdu, O noblest man. Let the dagger touch thee. Let the dagger pierce thee. Stabs him with a dagger. Power to talk. And I, I would advise you to be silent as well. Perfectly silent. We haven't discussed it yet. Oh, we'll discuss it later on. I swear. I, I never killed anybody. Never stole anything. I swear. I swear. I know that. Noblest and purest. Do you know who killed God and stole his identity card? Well, I can't reveal his name, though I could, I believe. Well, open your eyes. The conductor unbottoms his undercoat. From a pocket therein closest to his bare chest, he takes out a blank card and waves it before the eyes of the dying man. The passenger looks at it once and drops dead.
carry this heavy body of this man. He approaches the narrator. You there! Could you lend a hand? Come on. Let's carry him together. What should I do? What can I do? He holds a dagger. And, and, and I'm unarmed like you. I, I have nothing but my commentary. I, what should I do? What can I do? We're going to have a quick discussion right now. Um, Frank is going to moderate it with, with Marvin and the actors and the directors and myself. And um, then we're going to open up the floor for more Q&A afterwards. Well, um, thank you, everybody, for participating. And again, thank you, Sama, for putting this together, together with Robin as a co-curator. <laughs> and uh, also welcome to um, our viewers. This is now live streamed also through HowlRound around the nation. We'd like to thank HowlRound for being such a, a great partner and also for uh, uh, screaming um, this uh, last uh, play, which is of real uh, significance. Um, so maybe we'll start with Marvin. Wh Marvin, where does this play? You already said a little bit, but h how do you feel? How does it fit in? Is it in the Arab theater or also in its connection to European Western theater? I, I, I think uh, uh, the latter question is, it, it seems to me more striking that this is a, uh, uh, certainly th there, are, there are Egyptian elements in the play, uh, the, the uh, some of the references uh, and and the, the 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 particular way that names are used in the play and 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 the uh, 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 and and the, the 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 implied religious background and so on, but it seems to me that uh, the play is wants to be and is uh, much more international than that. That is, everyone recognizes. The, the, the whole problem of the identity cards or the lack of identity cards, the blank cards, the, the wonderful concept of the conductor eating it and, and, uh, 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 that, and the, the, uh, uh, the whole death of God controversy and who killed God. This is, a, this is an international 20th century question uh, and, and the, uh, uh, the play takes it in its own directions, but it seems to me that the, the the kind of concerns that the play sets up and the kind of dialogues that it sets up really make it a uh, a, a, a general statement of uh, of of modern life, modern bureaucracy, and and especially the uh, the inexplicability and and whimsicalness of of power and 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 and. And the use of power and the helplessness of the uh, of, of the of the character who confronts that all of those things seem to me uh, uh, we've we've seen this in Kafka we've seen it in so many different 
uh, uh, major modern figures. And that's true. Also, the absurdist Kafkaesque situation yes. uh, where he is in, and then that role of the uh, narrator, uh, which is so creative and interesting. And also, you know, we all are the witnesses. It was the, the narrator and what to do uh, about it. Um, Robin, um, normally when we're saying you would direct the, uh, uh, the, uh, the very first one, the Leroy James, you know, and, uh, and Kareem, what do this? I thought it was an uh, interesting choice. Did you choose to direct this or? Um? Uh, to some degree, yeah. Um, we were talking about this and, and the whole switching around of, of uh, roles and characters with the actors, and then we decided that we wanted to, to extend that conversation, like Salma said earlier, to the directors and their um, dealing with the different plays. Uh, and I certainly, I read uh, Night Traveler after Salma introduced it to me, and I kind of fell in love with it and, and really wanted to do it. Uh, uh, and I think it, what, what Marvin uh, just commented on with it being so international is so true. It wasn't, I mean, I'm from Norway, uh, and you know, it's a, it's a very different reality there than it is even over here, or than I would imagine that it is in Egypt. Uh, and, but it, I didn't feel like I had to go an extra distance to understand the dynamics working in the play. Um, because we all, we all, we all know these different characters. I mean, Sabur himself says that they're types, right? And we know these types. Uh, we, we know the dynamics in our own lives because these plays of power, um, they don't work only on the top and going down. We meet them every day, even if it's a, if it's a cashier or a security guard at an airport, or a bouncer at a bar. You know, we meet them every day. Um, and, and maybe we even, we even assume the roles in certain situations. Uh, and so because of that, uh, I think to some degree, one can approach all of these plays without having a hands-on experience with the roles that are in the play, if that makes sense. Um, as they are written. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And since we now have heard also from the directors, maybe also it's time to ask uh, the actors um, who kind of switched um, also um, the roles and covered, uh, um, is it three continents? Um, um, yeah. yeah, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in such a short time. Maybe, um, how did it feel? Maybe take the microphone also and uh, make sure it's pushed up, not only so we hear you better, but it is recorded. Yes, um, what, yes. How did it feel like, and how did any of those plays feel more closer or far away? Is it one endless play? Is it a variation? And um, so how did it feel? Oh, gosh. I, don't, uh, I, I, I think that... Um, we go the long line. Yeah, sure. We, I think that we all kind of came in with a, a certain amount of... Um, a little bit of like nervousness and trepidation of, of um, sort of like the, some of these enormous themes that we were, you know, about to go into. And, um, and it, it was surprisingly fun to just sort of like get to play in, in, in with some of these dark themes and, and also to find um, in ways in which we could relate to all of the characters. And, um, I love that we had the opportunity to, to take a turn at the oppressor and the oppressed. Um, and yeah. How did the, I mean, you connected with the Amiri Baraka, you know, some of those, how did it feel for you? Oh, it was, it was very frightening. It was absolutely frightening. I mean, it was, um, it was, it was very challenging. The first time I read, I, I think especially with the, the Pinter play and, and then um, with uh, the Dutchman, uh, both of those, just Pinter just being such like a strange world, you know, we, we, we spent a good deal of time at the table just talking about what is going on. Um, and we still don't know, because that is a play that produces more questions than answers. Um, and it's a, it's a very fascinating world to, to go into. But, you know, and just... Generally speaking, when it comes to the Dutchman, I mean, I was just, I just was really afraid to say the words. It was like, it, you know, it's, and, and. It was the reverse of the past. Yeah. I was the one who was saying, you just got to say it. 
Yeah, no, he, he had, <laughs> Jordan had excellent advice for me. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, for, let's go towards you, yeah. for any of these, it seems like uh, the main thread, I pulled this out because number one, we realized that for sure two of them specifically are supposed to be on a train station and then uh, um, one for the road. It doesn't really say where, but we, it, we love, there, there's this quote from um, Night Traveler. It says, the action of Night Traveler unfolds in a night train a simple symbol of a barren and senseless journey into the darkness of a meaningless existence. <laughs> so it, I think, uh, yeah, I think like once we heard that, we were like, you know, what would be interesting if you did, you know, produce it later on down the road and you did all three at the same time that you would imagine that one for the road would be in the MTA office so that it's like these two are in the subway and then we're in the holding office in that box where you never get any answers anyway. So it would, <laughs> it would really, I think it does, that, that's number one. I think the thread that I always like having is overall this universe. It feels very much in the subway, but I think the thread that I know, I love for all three. Um, I, I just did uh, Raisin in the Sun uh, and for the same Thing with the character of Lindner who tries to buy the house back from uh, the younger family. It's, it's not, you know, the worst kind of racism is actually not when they just blatantly say it to your face. It's actually when the person is like being a business salesman. Mm -hmm. And that's what it feels like all three are when you are the oppressor is like, look, I'm trying to help you out. And then the victim normally, specifically for the Dutchman and then also for Night Traveler, the victim is like, well, let me just play along with this and then see how long I have to deal with it and then hopefully they'll just shuffle away. And by the time you've played along so long, you're now in it and you can't get out. So I, I think it's like, it's, 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 a, it's a very complicated matter of how do you actually fall into this position because it seems for all three ones, it's, it's easier than you think. Yeah, no, um, sort of how these free plays interwine, but also kind of like seem to go on their own various themes. But, but there's also kind of like something to be said and also like piggybacking on what Jordan said. There's something to be said about like the whole idea of like people who are not normally seen as sort of like figures of authority, but they like to sort of like cling on authority. I mean, for instance, like with the train conductor, like it's somewhat like someone who just basically like takes your ticket, but then to sort of like take out to a whole new level into a, a, like a position of power and gets into that whole like existentialist like conversation that sort of like questions the identity, but also like stripping away that identity at, at the same time. It's sort of like, it, it kind of like, it's very befuddling, but also kind of like, I, like there's something to be said about that. It's sort of like everybody craves that like has a lust for that authority like wanting to sort of like have that power and exercise it on those who are like less fortunate than them. So I think there's something to be said about like that same th narrative thread all, cr all across free plays. Yeah, and how take some up there. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add on what Ali was just talking about, how universal it is, the dynamics between people once there's like the we were also discussing this yesterday, there's the slightest bit of authority. And not just that, but a chance to actually practice that authority and get away with it, which I, I, I felt throughout the three plays. But it's also very interesting that it's, it's an act and the oppressor understands that it's an act, yet they believe it. And their reference is probably their own oppressor. So it's like this endless, Cycle. Can I just add something quickly? Um, it was just interesting now, like just hearing your feedbacks and then realizing that one of the things that we were not consciously tracking, but maybe in the next rendition we would, um, is the role of the bystander, mm -hmm. which is the role of the narrator and then the role of um, like the, the people that help Lula and the conductor as well, like in, 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 in Dutchman. And then 
and one for the road. The question is, who would be the observer then? Would it be us? Would it be the person who's reading the stage, like the stage directions being that? Um, but yeah, that's something that I'm, that I think really resonated this time along more than just the oppressor oppressed dynamic, but also who's watching and what they're doing. Um, yeah. Um, and Marvin, just also as a question, do you? I mean, they were written between I think sixty four and eighty four. Um, would those pl plays could they be written right now, or do you think um, um, what we see now on stages, where kind of reality has perhaps more grip more in, um, are they in a way? plays of their times, or um, do you think they are still contemporary? Uh, well, I, they really are both, Frank. Uh, the, the, uh, they're, uh, all three plays are very much of their time. They were, they were all written at, at, uh, at, at times of, uh, of the threat of, uh, of that, kind of uh, that kind of government or uh, or that kind of private um, uh, pressure, uh, but if anything, I think that 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 threat is now maybe not not more common, but more universally recognized. That people are, are much more aware of this now. Uh, I have to say that. Uh, uh, as you know, I just came back from Egypt yesterday, and this play now works maybe better than it did under the under the regime in the '60s because uh, there there is a there is a repetitive power in in uh, in totalitarian regimes, uh, the way they operate, the kind of assumptions they make. And and the and and the way that they the way they negotiate and manifest their power, uh, and alas, I think we have uh, as widespread, maybe more um, worldwide pattern of of this kind of activity now than we than we did twenty or thirty years ago. So the plays, uh, the, the 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 particular. Particular references may tie them to particular instances, but as I said in the uh, in the case of Night Traveler, uh, you don't focus on those things. You focus on the the negotiations of power, and that hasn't changed at all. Just to piggyback on that, um, I think it's uh, it's a testament to how the the plays are of their time, but even more um, or more so uh, or more than that. Uh, in that we sit here now in 2018 and we have responses to the texts, right? They're not dated in a way where we hear them and we just have an intellectual understanding of them. We sit here laughing. Uh, I was crying at several points. Like, we have emotional reactions to these texts even today, which speaks to their uh, relevance, mm. I think. So, so NJ, do you think if though it would be at a theater, the Flea, or um, I don't know, the ER Art Center, would people come? Would people? Would would you direct it? Do you think mm -hmm. is the is it the right context? Uh? Yes, I I believe that it is the right context. I believe people will come. Uh, it's more it's more and more like theater of the oppressed. You want to see what's happening, and uh, it happens across the country. Things kind of happen in in groups, so like the Dutchman is being done in four different states. It's coming back to New York. So they did it in Arizona earlier this year. They they did it in Texas in March, and now they're planning on doing it in July. It's in conversation because it's being brought up. Um, I feel the same way about Night Traveler because I also thought of the parallels that we, the, that we recognize, especially with, um, the narrator's last comment, which was like, I'm just a commenter, and I thought about Twitter and live streaming <laughs> events and like how people, when you're watching a live event, you're on Twitter just commenting on everything that's happening, maybe blowing it out of proportion, or even that's the way that we people watch now, that we're like, oh my God, this person just walked over to this other person and they're asking them out, woo. <laughs> and it's, um, what happens when that gets turned on you? And you know, it happened in the beginning of like 
all of the movements, the Black Lives Matter movement, especially with um, all of the shootings that have been happening, uh, people are starting to call out the Twitter universe and be like, you can't just comment about it. What are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. Because commenting for a little bit was like, I'm supporting you, hashtag blah, blah, blah. But now it's like, well, you have to be active. So I feel like it would draw more people out and they, they too will maybe this will spark the revolution. Maybe that'll give them that impetus. It will be interesting if the uh, um, Dutchman will be done in New York, how the reaction will be. I remember, Marvin, you told about the story about when you went to try to see theater of Amiri Baraka and you uh, couldn't get in, right, at, in Jersey. Maybe you'd share the story and... Uh... Uh, yeah, well, uh, yes, it's, it's a kind of funny story. It's a kind of tragic story, uh, but it certainly is a story about power. Uh, the uh, uh, when uh, uh, when uh, Amira Baraka uh, created his own theater uh, in Newark, in New Jersey, a spirit house, uh, they opened with uh, uh, Slave Ship, wonderful, wonderful play. Uh, and uh, in those days, when I was younger and more foolish even than now. Uh, I decided I would go out into the wilds of New Jersey to, uh, to see the play. Uh, and I made my way out there, which is not easy. Uh, you, you took a bus out into a, uh, a, a, a pretty tricky neighborhood, and where I was obviously the only white within miles. Uh, and then there was a fairly long walk, and I, people looked at me as though I were some strange animal that had wandered in. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel any, any threat particularly, although I was clearly out of place. And I came to Spirit House, and uh, there was a big, well, it looked like a bouncer. I, I mean, I, 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 that's sort of what he was, I guess, at the door. And uh, he said, what you doing here, white boy? And again, it, it, you see, it's the, it's the, uh, as, as Sawa said, you get this, it, it, in all sorts of situations with cashiers, um, uh, people in the airport, uh, security people, well, I found myself rather unaccustomedly, because uh, I'm usually in the position of privilege and power, which he knew, uh, and I said, well, I, I'm interested in theater. I just came out, I came out to see the play. And he said, you get your white ass back to the city. So I did. <laughs> uh, but it, it, uh, uh, it, is a, uh, it is an interesting example of, again, we all knew the roles immediately. That was, that was just what it was. And, 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 uh, uh, he wasn't about to let me in. I mean, and and looking back on it, I was foolish to go there. Not not because uh, I was in any danger, but because it was inappropriate. I would have been a peculiar animal outside, wandering in, and probably a distraction. Uh, I just didn't know any better at the time. And, but and it very much was this. It was it was a very familiar dynamic. And in a way, also, how wonderful that theater created some kind of power where you, they could be in charge that you come in or you don't, you know what I mean? But maybe the only place in Newark in that moment where was, there were some kind of uh, choices could be made. But uh, before we go to audience um, and questions to uh, Robin and Salma, um, you said if we do it and when we do it. So what, is, what are your plans? And in the ideal world, what would you like, what would you really like to see? What would be the best scenario? when? So what will happen, or what do you really wish that will happen? Um, the idea is that now that we've seen it on its feet and we've experimented seeing like those three plays played together, um, I think the next step we'd like to bring in contemporary playwrights um, to write a contemporary response to those three plays. And then for, for, for those four productions to be sort of produced in one cycle at the same time of like the old and the new and the response, if there's, if there's a different response or maybe a Victoria, like whatever that response may be, um, it is a conversation between here and the now, but also a playwright from a different part of the world. 
um, than those three. So, so six plays altogether. No, no, no. It would be it would be our three plays and just one modern new play in response to those three, but from a playwright that is of the now and that is from a different part, from like not 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 from the USA, not from Egypt, and not from um, Europe or it, so England. If anybody is watching has an idea, they can. Yes, <laughs> totally. Uh, Robin. No, absolutely, and and like Salma said, that is certainly uh, what we'd like the next step to be, and and also to uh, to put it even more up on its feet, you know, and move away from a reading and actually into full productions. Um, I think would be very exciting. Um, we've also talked about. I mean, this is a conversation that we've been having for three and a half years. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's been a long time coming to this. Uh, hopefully, it won't be as long <laughs> into the next step. Um, but, but um, we've also d discussed making this into a larger festival. Uh, festival is a weird word to use when you're talking about oppression. Oppression, uh, but but um, doing many plays eventually would be interesting, and to really track how the, all of these themes are interwoven and and how they relate to each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, fantastic. Or maybe one day on a train, on a moving train, hey. you know, where people yeah. can get <laughs> So maybe um, um, uh, Mike or um, whoever is up there, or Isabella, um, some lights on the audience and um, some comments or questions, and we will give you a microphone, not only... Um, so we hear you better, but as I said before, it is live streamed and recorded, and, um, and so... Yo, he's taking my microphone. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's my power is gone. That's it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Michael behind you. Oh, per one and then two. Start first, yes, sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, in, the, in the last play, there was at the beginning, um, when, when the, the character was um, uh, repeating names, right? I don't know, these were like names from history, right? So for me, it, it was quite, uh, uh, quite interesting. So uh, because you said Alexander, and then you also said Hitler before. So was that intentional to connect the two? Because Alexander, if you really see him, I mean, he was probably, uh, um, I mean, he, he, he was a great conqueror, but he, was, he came from the oppressed. He, he united the, the Greeks in order to revolt against the, the Persian imperialism, which was, uh, uh, torturing, you know, and uh, uh, you know uh, the the the, uh, the Greeks. So, are you trying to put them like on the same on the same level? Uh, well, I'm certainly not, but Sabor might have. <laughs> um, uh, it's um, uh, it's certainly a list of of great leaders uh, through time, uh, and and so Alexander is mentioned, uh, Tamerlane uh, is mentioned, um, and, uh, and, and Hitler as well. And Hitler as well, and also Lyndon B. Johnson. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, I, I'm not sure necessarily, maybe Marvin has some input here, but I'm not sure necessarily what uh, Sabor uh, tried to accomplish with, with stringing those names together, uh, other than them being great leaders through time. I, I think I can help you out. Yeah, I think um, there was a word that uh, our other director um, used for the Dutchman, where he was like, it almost seems like my character was conjuring up his own oppressor. Because like, if you see, I kept asking questions. My guy could have just stopped engaging with her. But instead, he keeps, he's actually the provocateur. He's, he's, he's getting the answers out. And so in the same way, it seems like he's, although he's trying to think about these guys and why they succeeded or how they could be defeated, the mere thought and bringing them up, the narrator even says it, when you bring those names up, you're automatically bringing that idea to life again. Even if you're trying to, um, uh, even if you're trying to break it down and understand it, you're automatically, that, that uh, curiosity, it kills the cat. And so I think it's because he's bringing up and he's conjuring those names, even if he was trying to stop it, he's now called upon it. I think, I think more than anything, it feels like one of those Achilles heel, that you're, you're your own worst enemy, that you, the thing that makes you great is also the thing that destroys you. And because he's such a good thinker, 
he couldn't think his way out of the situation. Yeah. And we go over here to the question. I'm sure Alexander the Great's yeah. human rights record also is not completely spotless. I think it was mostly about, you know, oppressors, dictators, or... or um, Even more disturbing than the plays was the story that Marvin told. And I just don't understand that because Amir was a pretty friendly guy. Why he wouldn't want you to be out there to see. I mean, that's what theater is all about, is communicating. And so that... Uh, well, um, let, me, let me first uh, respond to this question, then, I, then to that one. Uh, and, and that is that uh, uh, it's a very interesting roster of people uh, that... Uh, and remember, the play is written in 1969. Think who Lyndon Johnson was at that time and what he represented. Inter, uh, internationally, maybe particularly in the Arab world, but certainly internationally. Uh, the, these are, uh, uh, even Alexander, uh, the, ki the, the Alexander that we see in this play is somebody who is really exalting in his power and his cruelty. Remember, he talks about taking down, I mean, there's, uh, 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 Aristotle tried to teach him, and he took care of Aristotle, and the, the uh, uh, the, 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 that kind of, uh, of drunkenness of power and, and enjoyment, or, or maybe, it's, maybe they're not even enjoying it anymore, maybe it's just a matter of custom, that connects all these people together, I think, at the beginning. Uh, but but uh, as, uh, well, I told this story to Baraka later. He came, he gra visited the Graduate Center, and we, we, we were, I was teaching a class in, in, in modern, uh, uh, in the modern theater, and we, t we talked about this. Uh, he was amused. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, whether, whether at that time, I, my, uh, I mean, he didn't, he didn't say, oh, if I'd known about it, I'd let you in. Uh, and I think he would not have, and I think he would have been right. That is, uh, I, when I say that, uh, I mean, on, on, on thinking about it afterward, I, re I really did think that uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the racial dynamics of theater going at that time were such that uh, with all the goodwill in the world uh, and all the tolerance in the world, I, I would have been a disruptive element in that in that situation. I really think I would have been, and I think the guy was right to send me back. Yeah, I, I don't understand that at all. I don't know why you. Well, would have, um, uh, it it ha it it has to do with uh, uh, with just uh, if you 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 like I are old enough to remember that in the in the in the late sixties and early seventies. This was not just a racial matter. It was a matter of, uh, of uh, different groups finding out or, or trying to find out, uh, especially uh, silenced or oppressed groups, gathering together out, out of the presence of the oppressor so they could speak freely among each other. Women's groups, for example, or gay groups that having somebody from the oppressive class there was, what we used to call it, a dampening element. Uh, and that was a real phenomenon. I, I, I witnessed it. Uh, I mean, I, I, was, I was always on the dominant side of the power equation, so it took me, it took me a long time to realize that, uh, that I could be a, uh, a, 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 a trouble, not, not, not disruptive in the sense I was causing any trouble, but then and I was a distraction. People would be not looking, only partly looking at the play, but partly looking at, what does that white guy think about this? How does, how does he feel about this? Um, but Marvin, I'm sorry, I want to cut in there. I mean, wouldn't you be part of the addressee? I mean, this is fascinating, but I, to me, the play is so much about a white addressee, right, in terms of audience. So I, I kind of wondered if people could comment on what their sense was as you were working on the plays. Like, who are these plays being written for? It's very well to talk about sort of the universal themes. And of course, that's what we sort of talk about, uh, you know, in 
kind of a cliche, in my opinion, about works of art, but okay, so we can do that, and, and there has to be that element, right, for people of different backgrounds and times and so on to relate to something. But I think to take it out of a particular moment also poses its own kinds of um, sort of drawbacks. And so I'm, I'm really interested in Marvin's kind of stor story, but I would hate to leave it there because it seems to me that the play is so very much about Right, the racial dynamics you're seeing of that time, which persist to this time, that that part of the addressee is the white oppressor. Otherwise, the play doesn't really work. It's not about the victims who are, you know, African Americans talking about how terrible it is to be victims. It's about calling out, you know, the white lo this, the the woman who represents a sort of nexus of problematically in Amiri Baraka's case, not just the racist oppressor, but she's also rendered in certain kinds of ways that are misogynistic, right? So, I mean, I think critically, it's a play that must have invited audiences at all times to be not just like where this is about, let's keep this contained within the black community. That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, Marvin, just to it's just, I think it's the, just an example, and, and it was also and the Marvin bouncer. So let's, let's be clear about what we're talking about. I did not go to see a production of Dutchman. I didn't go to see Dutchman. I, went, I did go to see Dutchman when it premiered down in the village. It premiered in, a, in an off-off-Broadway or an off-Broadway theater. Well, no, it was off-off-Broadway theater where the audience was almost entirely white and was meant to be, and Baraka knew that that's what it was. Uh, the, the, the different, different situations have different audiences. You know, Janae said, you can't do the blacks unless there is a single, unless there's a white person in the audience. And if there is not a white person, you must bring in one mm. to do the play. Now, you can say, all right, that's then, let's do it. We don't have to follow that. Of course we don't have to follow that. But we have to be conscious of what is the particular, oh, in theater more than anywhere else, we have to say, what are the physical, cultural, social conditions of this moment in time? That's what theater is. So maybe I feel very strongly you. about that. Yeah. What is the audience? What do you, what do you guys think is the audience? Well, specifically for um, Dutchmen and based off of like readings and actual documentation of when it was first produced at the Cherry Lane Theater, um, it was a predominantly white theater and Amir Baraka was, was, was like celebrated by the white community. Um, when he decided to take the play to the New Harlem Theater um, to a black community, it was not received well. It was received as a play that promotes white hatred from black communities, and there was so much resistance to that at the time. Um, so this is like this is an example of specificity of we know who it was made for and how it was received by two different communities. Um, yeah. Well, I would I would just I totally agree with you, and I would also remind people that. Uh, Especially at the at the beginning, or near the beginning of, of Baraka's career, where this comes, he wrote a a, a a manifesto of the Black Revolutionary Theater, which is a, a wonderful document, uh, and a very powerful and a very angry document. And the last sentence in that document says, "And the enemy which must be destroyed is those of you who are reading this." <laughs> and that's not the black community. <laughs> what would be your audience now, if you had to put it up? Where would you like to put it up? And uh, also, in the ideal world, what, what is, what, did you think that through? Um, no. Um, but, but thinking on it now, um, I, I certainly do think that New York is, is a very suitable place for it to be because New York is, has been for so many years and is 
uh, still uh, such a melting pot of different uh, people and backgrounds and, and internationals and, and Americans. Um, so I think so. I mean, but but I, I, I see these plays uh, working at other places too. I mean, let's do them in Europe. Let's let's go to Eastern Asia and do them there. Let's, uh, you know, do them in South Africa. I mean, What would be the ideal audience? Where, what part of New York would you? Well, uh, do, just to comment on that and actually link it to, to your comment, um, I feel that with these plays, one can certainly look at the specificity of each play and, and the notes uh, of each play. But to me, the interesting part is how they harmonize. Um, and how they come together and actually speak to each other. Uh, and for that to truly happen, I think that the audience needs to be as diverse as the plays are. Um, uh, uh, for, for those discussions to be truly uh, frugal and, and, and uh, truly healthy, I think that the diversity of both what happens on stage and what happens off stage is so important. Uh, I just well, uh, I like hearing that you want to do it in New York, but I, w I feel like these plays should be done, like probably like a nice college tour, because that's like getting it out there and like breaking people out of bubbles. You know what I mean? In New York, we can sit and nod and be like, yes, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I know, but like take it to North Carolina and then put it in a college there and you still have a, the diverse population of North Carolina with like international students and everyone and it just opens it up to that dialogue that, you know, it gives it more, I think, yeah. taking it on a... Absolutely. I like that idea. It's still an international, like an international audience but within a place that is not as diverse um, as New York is or at least as aware as New York is um, in regards to their audience's knowledge. Maybe one more comment, question? Oh. Um, one, two, let's see. Um, you've spoken about, well, we're talking about the audience and speaking of the audience, um, I'm fascinated by audiences. Um, I did my thesis um, years ago on um, the role of the audience and the assumed role in this agreement that we come into with the performers um, and each other uh, whenever we come into a theater. Um, it's a fascinating living role that nobody really talks about. Um, and I really enjoyed in uh, Night Train that you chose to end with Night Train because this sort of creeping sensation of our complicity in this situation runs through the first two pieces and then at the end of Night Train, the narrator turns and says, what do I do? Um, as though we're going to get up and help her. Um, and that's always the question for an audience of, you know, Hamlet is there being like, am I a coward? He really wants you to help him. Um, he's speaking to the audience at that moment and we don't, we sit there and we're like, you're gonna die. <laughs> um, and with the, you know, we're seeing, you know, in Night Train, we're watching this man dig his own grave um, as we are very familiar with at this point in our political history. Uh, NJ, you were talking about Facebook and, and Instagram, and we are an audience to all of these things that are happening, and we do nothing. Um, and when we are asked that question, please help me, what do I do? That really hits home. Um, and it was very effective to end with, with that. I think what's even worse now is that than before, because of Twitter and Facebook, people think that they're doing something by just commenting on the situation or doing a, or writing a post with a hashtag and that's it, like we've, do, we've done our part of activism, y'all. Like we've, we've, we've spread the word and that's it, which is more dangerous than just sitting and doing nothing because you think that you've done it. You've yeah. Last, last question. Um, yeah, that was great. And just the, the last, the piece of the narrator commenting, my first thought was like, on an emotional level, it's almost the same as an NPR commentator. Like, <laughs> like oh my gosh. Like, I was really struck by that. <laughs> um, 
But um, I just have one teeny tiny question. Um, the, the names in the last play from Arabic were, were translated from Arabic, except for the last one. The middle one was Vainglorious, and then the, the last one wasn't translated. I was wondering if you have a translation. Abdul? No, no. Um, there was a Z name, which is Vainglorious. Sultan? Um, and, then, and then one after that. Sultan, Zahwan. Um, yeah. Yeah, Zotan. Sultan is a sultan. Yeah. Um, there is a, right, there is a, I forgot the name now. It's Alwen. 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 Alwen ibn Sultan. Was Alwen ibn Zahwen ibn Sultan, or ibn Sultan ibn Zahwen. Alwen is, I, is there's no, okay, there we go. Someone of a higher um, stata. That's and it wasn't the the just to let you know the translations there were those were in the footnotes and we chose to to use them in the stage directions. This one was not in the footnote, which we should have thought about. So that's uh, something to think about. Thank you. So uh, okay, Can one one more. Let's give you the microphone. And uh, thank you. I'll just thank you. I have a very quick question about uh, the last play. What is stage in Egypt? You said it was produced in 1969, so was it staged in the same year or it was postponed up till the death of Nasser? Nasser. No, it was staged. Um, I don't know in which theater exactly, um, but it was staged, but it, it didn't have to wait for Nasser's time, but I know that the Salah Habta were around that like this play was not perceived well, but again, there are not, of, there are not a lot of records of those um, accounts like we there's no track of like proper production history in but, Egypt. But it's been it's been very popular since then. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I can look into it more and let you know. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Good. So um, again, uh, congratulations to both of you for dreaming up the project, uh, for all of you to participate in creating it, for the audience to come. It somehow passed fast, you know, for three plays, and for the social of you who stayed, and they're inspiring, and I think it was a, a, a great model also for a theater to put something out, to talk about it, and then talk about it again, and then talk about it. So I think uh, it's uh, something to be discovered in this way of uh, presenting work, and again, thank you very much, and uh, I think a big applause from us to all of you. Before we go, I just again I want to thank I want to thank everyone who had joined on this project and all the collaborators and Robin. But last but not least, I want to thank you, Frank. I want to thank the Seagull. I want to thank the Seagull staff for the great work, and I want to thank Frank for just giving that amazing opportunity. Thank you. And uh, I think we're gonna go around at the archive bar on 36 between Fifth and Madison. Um, on the north, on the south side, in case you would like to meet some of the collaborators or have additional questions.